Today, I am so super excited to introduce you to Dr. Rosa Patty. She is the director of the LLM and JSD program in intercultural human rights at St. Thomas University, Benjamin Crump College of Law. Dr. Patty will be here with us today talking to us about their special program. And we are so super thrilled to have you. And we want to thank you for being here. We are going to let you introduce yourself and just walk us through your journey as to how you became interested in the field and how your own personal journey has impacted your current work. So once again, thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rivera, for having me with you today. It's, of course, my pleasure and delight to be here. And um, as you already introduced me, uh, my name is Rosa Patti. I direct, co-direct, should I say, the Master of Laws, the LLM, and the JSD in intercultural human rights. So we have a master's program and a doctoral program in intercultural human rights at St. Thomas University, Benjamin L. Crump College of Law. I also direct the Human Trafficking Academy there, the John J. Brunetti Human Trafficking Academy. I hold an endowed chair here, so I am St. John Paul II Distinguished Professor of Law, so a tenured professor of law at St. Thomas University. Uh, you ask me about how my journey intersects with what I do. I am originally from Albania, so I grew up under a dictatorial uh, regime, part of the Eastern Bloc uh, uh, back in the Southeastern Europe. And uh, of course, uh, as many of those who have uh, come in this great Republic of USA and grew up uh, in circumstances under dictatorial regimes, I could think Cubans, for instance, uh, here in Miami where I live, but many other parts of the world as well, you understand that one of the most fundamental issues are the violations of uh, human rights and all kinds of rights and violations of the dignity of the human person. And uh, so kind of naturally it came to me that after uh, the fall of Berlin Wall and after the fall of uh, old regime in my uh, country, I was involved at that time with politics and others. And uh, I'm very happy to say that was among those uh, first elected officials and also appointed officials in the local government of my country, but also as a member of uh, cabinet, a secretary of state for youth and women. I was an, an elected official, uh, ran for office, was member of parliament uh, as well. And uh, of course, in those difficult times in the country when we are uh, moving from a uh, one party system to a multi party system, from a closed regime into an open regime and a democracy and i'm delighted that was amongst the uh, first uh, with uh, in the early 90s uh, with the good team then in the in 2001 i came to the united states actually as a student in the program that uh, now i direct co-direct with my colleague and uh, I was offered a job uh, to continue as a director developing the program, uh, which I accepted with the idea that I am going back. But uh, fast forward over two decades, I'm still here. And uh, so that's my journey. I am also very much uh, involved. Uh, I am Catholic and I'm very much involved with the Catholic Church. I have been blessed to have uh, two papal appointments, one from Pope Benedict XVI uh, to be a member of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, and uh, then by uh, Pope Francis, uh, uh, confirmed recently as well in a new mandate uh, as a member of the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. Human trafficking has been also very much of interest to me and uh, was introduced to the problem in the early 90s uh, back home in Albania when the Albanian girls were disappearing and uh, from we're reading in the newspapers we thought that they were quote unquote they were prostituting themselves where the reality was completely different because they were actually forced into prostitution so they were uh, trafficked and uh, hence my interest started there and then continued here. Since uh, early 2000, 2003, 2004, here at St. Thomas, uh, 
I was able, uh, through the support at that time of the president of the university, uh, Monsignor Casal, and at that time, the dean of the law school, Bob Butterworth, had the support to work in the field of human trafficking. And later, in 2010, we set up the Human Trafficking Academy through a Department of Justice uh, uh, grant. And afterwards, through the generosity of one of our local businessmen, the John J. Brunetti, uh, named after and really now we are operating on that basis. So in a nutshell, I should really stop, but that's pretty much what I do at uh, St. Thomas Law. In addition to teaching in the various areas of international law and human rights law, mostly that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Patty, for, for your introduction and all the amazing work that you do. As we know, you direct the LLM program, and that's something that we're very interested in. As you know, we do help students with their applications to law school. And we want to ask you about the requirements of your program. If a student is interested in, in applying to your program, what are the, the steps? And if you can walk us through the steps and, and requirements for an applicant that, that might be interested in, in applying. Of course, with pleasure. And thank you for the opportunity again, because we are absolutely interested in a reaching out to a broadest possible audience to educate uh, present generations and generations to come in the field of human rights, which is such a, a fundamental area of law and uh, policy and actually fundamental for a betterment of the society, of the human family as a whole, humanity as a whole. Our application process is uh, relatively simple and pretty much, I would say, it might resemble many others as well. Uh, I would first would like to address any person who is uh, interested in our a Master of Laws program in Intercultural Human Rights to check us out, I meaning go to our website www.stu.edu slash human rights. And when I say to check us out, is this what you want to do? We would like to have individuals that come to our program that are genuinely interested in the area of human rights. Those that are thinking that they are part of the change, they are part of those that bring social changes for the dignity of each and every human person and for the development of each and every human being and of the whole human being. When they go to our program, they are able to see that. Is this something they want? And then, of course, the next thing I would say is important to say is the eligibility requirements. Where do I fall? Of course, our audience is quite a mix. We have international students, legal professionals, and then we have domestic students, legal professionals, but we also have another category of students, non-legal professionals. And they uh, both uh, foreigners and domestic applicants are very much welcome to apply to our program. So if we can split them into, say, two audiences geographically, domestic and international would be one setting, a little bit different requirements because for international students, there are a few more items as they would have to provide, and I can go over them. And then also, when we talk about eligibility, who are you in the sense where, what's your background, where do you come from, what are your education credentials? So both legal professionals and non-legal professionals are all welcome to apply. For the non-legal professionals, there is an extra requirement. They really have to prove that they have a genuine interest in human rights. They have a proven commitment to human rights. And when we say a proven commitment, their life, their CV would really tell us that. What is it that they have done? What is it that they aim to do? There are various ways that they are able to prove this to us. CV is one of them. Letters of recommendation are others uh, that to people who tell us what it is they did. And of course, the personal statement. So for the foreign applicants, we also ask uh, an English proficiency. So they would have to check out on the website and uh, know that they, this program is delivered in English, in uh, writing and orally, of course, in the United States. And uh, they need to have a certain level of English proficiency. And for foreign applicants, also their credentials must be evaluated from one of the agencies that are accepted. And we have all that information on our website. Kind of this is the 
homework they would have to do before they even send an application to us, because we will ask them to have proof of their English proficiency, proof of their academic credentials evaluated for the for giving us, meaning in the United States, the U.S. equivalencies. Because as a minimum, we say bachelor's degree as a minimum credential academic requirement to be eligible to apply. But also note that, uh, as you, I'm sure you know, and probably many, many others do as well, uh, in the United States, uh, legal professionals already hold a previous bachelor's degree, another degree, a college degree, before they are able to go to law school. But in many jurisdictions around the world, many countries of the world, students can go to law school straight from high school, uh, which means then the equivalency in English uh, would be a bachelor's degree, or rather a functional equivalent of a JD degree for legal professionals, if it is that they studied law. So these are kind of the intricacies that are important for the international applicant to know in advance. Nothing too difficult, but good to know. And of course, all the information is on the website. And then, of course, they have to write a personal statement. My advice for whether foreigners or uh, local applicants, local meaning whether local Miami, local Florida or local USA, they uh, have to read very carefully what is it we are looking for in our personal statement. I think it's important that they portray themselves exactly who they are and again to let us know why this program in intercultural human rights and we know there are across the country many universities offering all kinds of programs we want to make sure that this program is fitting to the applicant that we are going to consider for admission and then later to educate them uh, here. The personal statement I think is really important because particularly for non-lawyers, I would say it's from that that we see we are asking for the proven commitment to human rights and to why you want to study human rights. Personal statement would really tell us a lot in that regard, in addition to other elements in the CV. Important as well to know in the application process is that they have to order directly their official transcripts, degrees that they hold, both foreign applicants and domestic applicants as well. They have to collect reference letters. We ask for reference letters, update their CVs, send us their CV where they stand. We accept applications either through LSAC, Law School Admissions Council, are directly to us, so uh, both venues are very much welcome. They can just then pay a fee, and uh, that's all there is. After we consider the submissions, then we shortlist those that we would like to interview. So we always have an interview component in the application process. And I'm sure you understand the reason why, because it's just such a specialized degree. And again, whatever the goal of the person is, including the foreign lawyers, sometimes they just... Their goal is to sit for the bar in a U.S. jurisdiction and an LLM degree is required as such, but we just do not want them to formalistically only like that. When they come to our program, they would also want to have a degree in human rights because if, if it is just to have an LLM degree, they have other programs anywhere else that are just much simpler, not necessarily very much specialized. A general LLM would do that as well. And hence, that's why I say it's absolutely important, the interview component that we have. And then if admitted, it's easier for the locals. They just take the seed deposit and we are here for them and we take it from there in terms of orientation and so on. For the international students, lawyers or non-lawyers, uh, then there is the visa issue. So they will need an I-20 form that is issued by the university. There are certain forms that they have to submit, including financial support forms, and then they have to apply for the visa, get the visa, the student visa, the F1 visa, and then they would be ready basically to study in the U.S. Thank you so much for, for your detailed in, information. And so for an applicant who might hear you and, and, and might say, wow, this seems overwhelming or it seems very complicated, are there any steps or advice that you might have to prepare ahead of time? Let's say that a person, an applicant is still an undergraduate and they're thinking long term, or a person who might be a foreign applicant is currently perhaps an attorney in their country. What steps should they be taking ahead of time so they do not feel overwhelmed by perhaps what appears to be a complex but obviously necessary requirement to enter your program? 
That's a very good question that you have. Again, the program is a Master of Laws in Intercultural Human Rights. It's important for the applicant to know that this is what they really want to study. So if they are in college or in the foreign jurisdictions, they might even be in the law school studying because they would go straight from high school into law school, different from, let's say, in the United States, you have to have a college degree before you go into the Juris Doctor uh, program. But whichever way, at whatever time they are a student with a goal to get into our program, I would say very important is their engagement with issues that relate to human rights, with activities that relate to human rights. Over the so many years now, since 2001, that our program is in existence, we always see in their personal statements some extra ordinary students, amazing work that they have done and experience that they have. And uh, our program has this variety of ages as well of students. Most of the time, those are quite young. But of course, there are a lot of others that go back to school. I went and had my doctorate degree when <laughs> I was rather aged and had a whole family and so much more. But many of us go back to school, even uh, getting older. But then we also have students that we have had students in the late 70s in our program. So from early 20s to late 70s, all in one. So imagine the wealth of experience and expertise that they have. And some of these students that come from various parts of the world and even from the United States, sometimes some of the more marginalized communities and minorities and so on, they have extraordinary life experiences, but also the work that they have done, engagement with student organizations when they were with charitable organizations, non-governmental organizations. They might have done uh, research and uh, writing. They might have been involved in advocacy, in raising awareness on important matters and so on. So these are the things that we think are important for those that want to kind of prepare themselves for the program. And then I guess I might have made the application process even more difficult than it really is, but I tend to be detailed in mentioning things. But again, it's very much self-explanatory when they go into our website. But for foreign applicants, I always like to stress the importance of evaluating your credentials if you want to study abroad, I, most likely anywhere, definitely in any program in the United States, but probably in other countries and other parts of the world as well. And of course, ordering original transcripts and good timing. But Consolidating your resume, building up your resume, getting engaged in issues that matter to you. It's extremely important to look inwardly. Who am I and what is it I want to do? What do I want to do with this degree? There is absolutely nothing wrong in just going into a master's program for personal enrichment. We have had some, recall we live in Miami, so we have quite a number of people that have come to the program. They said, just, hey, you know, it's a long time I have been out of school. I got time now, my kids are married, are out. I have so much time, I just want to study and I want to do something good. So personal enrichment, and then after that, they realize that they can do a lot of good with a degree, and we have had these cases as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I want to pick up on, on what you just mentioned, do a lot of good. Can you provide some sort of insight as to what your students do after they graduate from your program, obviously with such diverse and rich education, there might be different possibilities available to all of these graduates. What do they usually end up engaging in and what resources do you provide to ensure that they get to their ultimate goal, which is actually to serve. Thank you very much, Ms. Rivera. That question is really important because as I mentioned earlier, but as every applicant that's studying has a goal in mind and uh, many of them also have career goals in mind. So I mentioned personal enrichment earlier, but that's not the only thing. And I am absolutely delighted to share with you that our grads have been making significant strides and contributions throughout the world. Our students have left a mark in various institutions starting from the United Nations. We have had uh, several of our graduates working 
at the UN, for the UN, some still working for the UN in various capacities all around the world, including in the headquarters in uh, Geneva, but also in various parts of the world, there is countries in Africa, in Latin America, and uh, so on, in the UN office for on, uh, drugs and crime, in important institutions like the ICRC, and the Council of Europe, uh, for those that came from Europe, in the African Unity, and so on. So it depends where the students came from and what is it they wanted to do. But also, a number of students have had an interest in uh, going into academia. So quite a number of our grads had actually gone into academia, become professors, some in top flight uh, universities. We have graduates that are co-directing uh, programs, uh, like one of ours is at Harvard uh, now, in the human rights program at Harvard. We have had in Columbia University, I'm mentioning some in the US, but all over the world, they have set up their uh, human rights programs, their institutions within various academic uh, institutions that they have been placing themselves. They have published in uh, all kinds of uh, fora, scholarly work uh, and uh, other kinds of work. A number of them were governments for courts, some have become judges, uh, prosecutors, and uh, all of them share with us uh, stories, wonderful stories of how the program has empowered them or how they have been able to really make a difference. We had a student uh, from Egypt, for instance, that uh, wrote to us uh, after he had started working uh, there that he was able to identify a human trafficking case uh, of uh, uh, some Chinese nationals when all the rest were considered to be a case of prostitution, for instance. And uh, uh, students in Romania, in Ethiopia, in Colombia, they have set up academic programs in their respective institutions. Quite a number of our grads have created their own not-for-profits, non-governmental organization and making a huge difference uh, in their communities, both here in the US and in other parts of the world. And of course, some, as I said, working for different agencies in governments, some in important policy institutions that relate to issues of human rights. And of course, quite a number of them are attorneys that incorporate in their uh, daily practice of law, depending what area of law, whether it is immigration or criminal law or family law, integrating the tenets of human rights law and policy, and this way being much better able to serve their clients and thus comply with their own responsibility as legal professionals to the people that they represent. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Extremely wonderful to see such a diverse of, of career path. And I'm pretty sure that it must be so rewarding to see so many applicants who feel so passionate about the work that they're doing. And I want to ask you in terms of the steps or programs that you have to support minority students who are currently enrolled and who are probably thinking about applying to your program. We, St. Thomas University generally, St. Thomas University College of Law specifically, and our human rights program, even more specifically, we really pride ourselves in the commitments and the openness to our minority students. A few things that I'd like to uh, note here makes our program stand apart from others is its diversity and openness to minorities. Because I would say that apart from the United Nations, probably there is no other institution as diverse in cultures, races, nations, ethnic groups, social classes, professions, and all walks of life as the Catholic Church is, and now we are a Catholic institution and uh, of uh, higher education. And we are also, we consider ourselves to always be in this permanent state of mission. So our human rights program, this LLM program, provides this attention to culture and diversity and this preferential treatment for the minorities 
and so on in an exemplary way, I would say, because it's not only that multicultural dimension that we talk about, because we are in Miami, kind of almost by default, we are multicultural, but we have our own brand of interculturalism, which means a focused commitment to how cultures interact and uh, this commitment to a dialogue among and across cultures, nationalities, races, ethnicities, faiths, and uh, so on. As I said, we have had the students from over 95, close to 100 countries of the world. Then in our St. Thomas Law School, we also have the Center for uh, Social Justice. At the law school, we have all kinds of internships and externships that are all over the country and also abroad and so on. Accomplishments in the area of uh, diversity and really this great fertile ground, a welcoming ground for minority students has also been objectively assessed. For instance, the Hispanic Outlook in Higher Education a magazine ranked St. Thomas as the number one law school in the country for Hispanics. The Princeton Review, in its best law schools rankings in 23, rated our College of Law as number one for greatest resources for minority students. In 22, ranked us as number seven in the country for the best resources for women and consistently ranked us among the top for the best environment for minority students, most diverse faculty. The pre-law magazine listed our College of Law among the top of the best schools for racial justice. In 2023, our graduating class consisted of 82% minority students and 65% uh, of these graduates were female students. In our program, in our LLM program, even more so. I would say that over 90% that are minorities. What does that mean? It means that while our identity is that diverse as our universal Catholic Church is, diverse as United States is, all these, I can say, accolades that St. Thomas Law School, Benjamin L. Crump Law School, College of Law, has earned, it means because we genuinely have a total focus on helping out uh, minority students. We consider ourselves as an access school, which means a number of our students in the law school, in the JD program, and in the LLM as well. Most of them most likely are, and I'm saying most likely because it depends each year, but uh, most of the time they are first generation law school students. And some of them, uh, even first uh, generation college uh, students. So it's not a usual audience that we attract. We are very specific and very open so to that diversity and this uh, 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 preferential treatment for minorities, all based on merit. I don't want to be misinterpreted. It's all meritorious. But amongst the minority students, there are some extraordinary individuals that need our help. So internally, we work on one on one. We have counselors everywhere. At St. Thomas University, we call ourselves the St. Thomas family. So once you are admitted, voila. You are a member of St. Thomas family. Welcome to that. And it comes with all of it. So we are here to support you. We are that super great support system that the family provides. That's why we say family. But we are also here to hold you to task. We are not here to be your friends. We are here to be your educators. And we expect that commitment from you, that grit from you. And we are right there extending the arm. So. Each and every office in our university, in our law school, is at the disposition of the student at any point, at any time. Our faculty and staff administration, everyone have an open door policy. It's not only open door policy during the office hours. If I were to show you my syllabus, for instance, and when it talks about office hours, it says, you will routinely find me on these days, normally three days from this time to this time, but I welcome you at any time. And normally in my case, I only say, don't call me just for Sunday morning when I go to church, but for the rest, 
I am willing to accommodate you. My colleagues do exactly the same. We also work with minority students proactively. We don't just expect them to come to us. We go to them. So we are the observant community of faculty and counselors and administration. We do not let students fall through the cracks. At St. Thomas Law, in our program and in the JD program, in the LLM program, in the JSD program at St. Thomas Law School, you are not a number who just pays the tuition. You are a person. We know your name. We know you. We know your story. And we reach out to you. We help in the career development. We help you in the process while you are studying. We know that students have all kinds of uh, challenges, personal challenges. We are not cut from all from the same cloth. We are unified in human dignity, but we are all individuals. And we all come with different experiences and backgrounds. And not everybody had the opportunity to start at the same line. And we are very much aware of that. So we want to make sure, it sounds cliche that you don't want to leave anyone behind, but we really don't. So in a Spartan way, in our program, we are thoroughly dedicated to our students. I can give you an example. This year, for instance, in the LLM program, we had a number of students that were foreign lawyers. I guess by word of mouth, they tell each other what they, uh, they are enrolled in the program. And some of them were planning to sit for the bar in some jurisdiction in the United States that accepts foreign lawyers with an LLM degree to sit for the bar. So they uh, got enrolled in the program and we told them about opportunities that we have. And then we asked, what else do you need? because they contact the respective bar and then they tell us here's what else is needed. And we realized that there are quite a number of them, for instance, that needed to take, let's say, constitutional law and uh, or uh, professional responsibility or legal writing. Now, normally in quite a number of schools, what would happen? You have the LLMs in the program, they tell you here are the JD courses, go ahead, get enrolled, compete with the rest. And we realized that this group of foreign lawyers would have been disadvantaged if we just threw them with the JD students in, let's say, the classes that I mentioned. So then we thought, let's just create a different opportunity. Let's just have them in separate sections of these courses when they are with each other. That puts them in an environment that is more supportive for them and also a professor that knows that he's working with foreign lawyers. People that did not get educated in the United States, but they went to law school straight from high school, not the JD student that went first college and that knows the standardized tests and so on, but for our professors, that's knowing that this group of students have different demands. This is a minority group. We also try to, to get bilingual professors as well. It's not for their English, but it's for the understanding and the way of thinking. And also because of the legal terminology that normally exists in the various different jurisdictions and in different languages as well. So we create these opportunities and kind of say we tailor make the program for the student. So at the start of the program, we talk with the student, me and my colleague, uh, the other director of the program, Professor Wiesner, we meet with students individually and we tell them, tell us uh, what is it uh, that your goal is? We know we read in your personal statement, but maybe now you, you are a little bit clearer and what is it you really wanna do so that we can advise you, not just tell you here is the schedule, pick and choose the courses that you want, but also let us tailor the courses and your individual schedule to the goal that you personally have. And I think that has uh, really helped students very much so by their own admissions, uh, as they tell us, and uh, also in their career. I am absolutely thrilled that uh, even like 15 years later or so, I get emails from grads of so many years ago and uh, that, hey, I recall when you helped us with this and guess what I did with that. And I think it is because of a very specific attention to the individual. So we are all the same in God's image and have human dignity.
but we are also different. And this is the beauty of the diversity. Listening to you, it is just palpable the care that is provided for you know, so many students, minority students, and, and to make them feel so welcome. I'm pretty sure that it translates directly into their success and how comfortable they feel while they are in your program. And I, and I really like how you refer to them as part of a family, right? That one, once you become a student, you are part of the family and how the professors are proactive in reaching out. And, and that is very important for, for students, as you mentioned, who might face unique challenges. And I have a question, uh, and I know you touch upon that briefly, and it has to do with the bar exam. You did mention that you provide a program and, and you ensure that they're prepared. Can you, can you shed some more light as to how that process looks like? And if a student wants to stay in the United States and practice, how would that landscape look like? When we talk about preparation for the bar exam, we are not talking about the students, including foreign students that are enrolled in the Juris Doctor program. That is a different category. So in the Juris Doctor program at St. Thomas College of Law, there are numerous uh, resources, but I am not the one who is in charge of them. But we have a, an amazing team in the academic success uh, programs that we have. And uh, I wouldn't be able to even count the programs that they have in uh, plenary sessions and individualized programs as well to prepare students for the bar. But that's another story. But let's talk for the, the other category of students, those foreign lawyers that come in the LLM program, and then they want to take the bar exam in some jurisdiction in the United States. Uh, first of all, uh, we do not direct students, our students that get enrolled in the program, foreign lawyers, towards one jurisdiction or another. We don't do that. We allow them, or actually we task them, if that's what they want to do, for them to find out what jurisdictions they want to take the bar exam in and what the requirements are of that specific state bar, because state bars, of course, vary and so on. And uh, for instance, in the state of uh, Florida, foreign lawyers, at least until recently, there is already a decision being made, but uh, still more in the works for the true process of it. Foreign lawyers couldn't take the bar in the state of Florida, not until now, and again, still in the process. But in various jurisdictions, foreign lawyers are allowed to do so. And we ask them, find out what the requirements are and where is it that you want to go. And uh, then, based on that, we make sure that while they are students in the LLM program, they satisfy the requirements for the LLM program in intercultural human rights, which is of fundamental importance to us because we are educating human rights lawyers for legal professionals I'm talking. So there is a set of credits, a certain number of credits and courses that they would have to take in order to graduate with an LLM in intercultural human rights. But we also allow students, we allow them quite a large number of credits, 11, 12 credits available as electives. So required courses, credits in order to get the degree, the LLM in intercultural human rights, and then a number of credits free within the 24 credit requirement that is for the degree that they can choose from the broad array of elective courses that we offer. The elective courses that we offer are kind of twofolded, if you will. Some are human rights related, human rights law and policy. So in addition to the required human rights courses, we also have quite a variety of elective credits, elective courses in human rights, and the second category is American law courses that these foreign lawyers that want to take the bar in some jurisdiction are interested to take, which means courses that are offered in the JD program. And over the years, that's what we have worked with. So we have had, let's say, a couple of foreign lawyers that want to take because not all foreign lawyers are necessarily wanting to take the bar somewhere else, but some are. And with them, we have worked more individually and have them take the courses from American law, doctrinal courses, basically, whatever they needed, whether it was contracts, criminal law, constitutional law, uh, procedure, professional responsibility, legal writing, etc., etc., whatever they have needed to. 
Now, in terms of what they want to do with the degree, it also will depend. We have two categories of foreign lawyers. We have, and we have in the U.S., the foreign lawyers that are now permanent residents of the United States or even nationals, uh, U.S. citizens, naturalized U.S. citizens, but they are working into some other area because their law degree is not necessarily functional here unless you are going and taking the bar. And again, each state bar having different requirements for that. So when we consult with them in the information sessions, when we have, even before they apply, in reaching out to them, we ask them, what what is it you want to do? So some tell us I'm working as paralegal, for instance. Okay, that's great. Are you enjoying it? Yes, I love what I'm doing. I have learned so much, but guess what? I like to go to court and I can't do that because I don't have. How about you being able to sit for the bar and then being also able to go to court in whatever the jurisdiction is? Or if it is in a federal courts, you can take the bar in any jurisdiction. It doesn't have to be Florida and be in Florida and still practice immigration law, for instance, or whatever other federal law. So this is a category of students we work with and approach individually. This is one category, which means they also have a greater possibility of being integrated into the legal profession. They take the LLM, they take the courses that they need from the American law, they prepare for the bar, they take the bar, they pass the bar, and they practice. We have had over the so many years a number, large number of this category of students. The second category are the foreign nationals that are coming directly to our program on F1 visas that I was talking earlier. And uh, of course, they are not necessarily eligible to work in the United States. So then if they want, they can still sit for the bar if they want and so on, go through the procedure that I mentioned. But then to work in the U.S., they have to go through the, according to the immigration laws that the U.S. has for employment and so on. Finding an employment somewhere, somebody sponsoring them on a work visa or labor certifications, etc. Or applying for permanent residency, whatever the various uh, possibilities that our immigration system has. But these are the two distinct categories. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. And I want to ask you, what do you think are usually the the most common misconceptions about pursuing an LLM and how does your program work to dispel that misconception? Okay, I would do, uh, construe this sentence first, uh, misconceptions in the application process. I have noticed over two decades now that I work uh, in this uh, program, I have noticed that at times applicants submit one and the same kind of application to the numerous programs. So they do not diversify their application while they are actually diversifying the institutions. So they are applying for an LLM program in 10 universities, for instance, and then they are sending one and the same personal statement, for instance, to all of them. So I think that is a total misconception. And particularly, let's say, foreign lawyers, for instance, they very well describe themselves, who they are and so on. And then they say, I'm looking for a program in the United States. Okay, then I would like to see something more than just you wanting to uh, to uh, study in a program in the United States. This is a program that is in human rights law. And how about you individualizing your application according to the program? And uh, also look at the requirements of the program. Each program has different requirements, which means even in your CV, you might have a CV that consists of 10 pages, 15 pages, but what is the relevancy of what you have done to the program that you are also applying. So these things also matter. Or even the in the choice of letter of recommendation, for instance, if a program is asking for, let's say, two letters of recommendation and you have listed five, six people and so on, including friends, maybe what I am asking is I want to see how you perform 
if you are a student, it's quite a luxurious position to be a student in my in, in my view, at least, particularly having been somebody that went to school and then worked and went back to school and then worked and then back to school and then worked. So this variety, it's always, again, I consider it to be a luxurious position to be a student, but at the same time, you want to make sure that in whatever you are studying, you are showing the specific program why exactly you want this program. Because we would like, in our program particularly, we would like to see the people who have the passion for the law, the passion for human rights, people that want to do good, people that want to do just and are dedicated to justice, but are also dedicated to social justice in all in the best meaning of the word. People that know the problematic of the society, people that do not just see separate that there is no such a thing of, let's say, the importance of morals to law. These are connected. You cannot be just separating just abruptly all of these issues because we human beings are complex. And I think that's what I'd like to see when I am reading an application because I want to know the person. And I think that's one thing that is important. And again, the misconception is run-of-the-mill application applicable to all. What we do to kind of dispel that in the information sessions, just like I am telling you now, me and my colleagues, we try to make this very clear. And we probe it in these interviews, for instance, as well. We probe with questions. And uh, we would not be necessarily very happy, let's say, you come from country X and we ask you about something that is going on right now at the time and you don't even know because that relates in the field, I mean, in the field of human rights or some important, let's say, change in a law that will be impacting various strata of the population and so on. So uh, we like the curious student. We like the genuinely interested student because it is the curious student that goes the extra mile, is the curious student that will take the time here, will persevere to learn well, to adopt that knowledge, which is absolutely important, but we'll do something with it afterwards. And we also want to see the pers a person that is also passionate for the cause, because human rights is not uh, just contract law. There is nothing wrong with that. But for those that are doing that kind of law and the transactional law and so on, perfect, so be it. But human rights law is a different genre of law. And doesn't matter what area of law you're practicing, if you don't fail it, if you don't understand the fundamental tenets of human rights law and its existence, it's, it does, it's not just the positive law. It's not the black letter law that the governments put black on white in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, a prohibition of torture, genocide, and so on and so forth. It's not only that, it is more than that, because all that the law is doing is only recognizing what is existing already, just by the nature of our humanity. And that is what matters. We would like people to understand that. And if it is not fully understood, we would like to instill that. But again, the curious, the one who has the grace, the one who is thoroughly dedicated, does all of this. One more thing I'd like to mention here. Sometimes uh, um, another challenge that people see or misconception, oh, maybe going to school is not for me because I'm so busy, I am working, I have a family, and so on. I always say, we can always make room for anything our heart desires. The matter is, what is your priority? And I use the word in singular. Sometimes we say, oh, we got, I got my priorities in plural wrong. And I think just by starting it this way, you already know you're talking about priorities. The word priority is supposed to be one. So how about have a hierarchy of what's important to you? And particularly, I encourage women and minorities all the time because we particularly, we have our spouses, we have children, we have a home to hold and so on. And sometimes they say, oh, let me do this, let me do this, and then I'll go to my career. Talking with uh, those that are interested 
interested in the program, even before they apply. I say, you can do what you set your heart to do. And we are never tried beyond our strengths. God doesn't try that this way. If he tries us, it means we can do it. We don't know of our strength. So you can work. And that's why we have the program in the evenings. And guess what? Overwhelmingly, some years we have 100% of students working because even foreigners, we give them positions on campus, either as researchers or graduate fellows or whatever else. So they are fully working. They're taking the classes in the evenings. So it's also that can-do attitude that we try to tell them. Yes, you can. And it's a matter of, again, what is your priority? Is this what you want? And I think that's absolutely important for each and uh, every one of us. Thank you so much, Dr. Patty. Not only are you providing such very useful information, your words are also inspirational. So I'll remember that. Not priorities, but the priority beyond ecstatic that you have been able to carve out some time out of your busy schedule to talk with us. And I'm pretty sure that our audience is going to really appreciate all of the information that you have provided with regards to your program at STU Law. And uh, once again, if you want to provide your website or any contact information, you mentioned that most of the information is in the website. If you want to provide our audience with the website, I'm pretty sure that many members uh, will be interested or would know of someone who is interested. So if you can provide your website once again, that will be very much appreciated. Our website is uh, www.stu dot edu slash human rights actually even just googling uh, llm human rights at st thomas law miami will, would also be another way of uh, easily uh, reading and uh, finding out about our program and uh, miss rivera i want to thank you for your time and uh, the wonderful and genuine uh, interest that uh, you have and your organization It is just uh, wonderful to know that you're reaching these uh, audiences and providing them with uh, valuable information that they otherwise uh, wouldn't get. So I am much grateful to you. Thank you so very much and uh, God's blessings. Thank you. And thank you so much for, for being here with us. And as I said, it has been our pleasure. If this video has been useful to you, please make sure to like and subscribe. And if you know anyone who might find this information helpful, please make sure to share the information.